Um, might have one Friday. Page 927, I believe, is where we left off. <clears throat> and I'm going to do kind of what we started doing last Wednesday. I'm going to tell you the words or the phrases, the, the bold faced things that you need to know. Okay, and those that I don't mention, don't worry about. So on 927, you have several wor words. Lack of sleep and neck all messed up. I can't talk. Um, you've got several words in bold. Know all of those. Okay. In rhyme, internal rhyme, masculine rhyme, feminine rhyme, exact rhymes, near rhyme, also called off rhyme, slant rhyme, and approximate rhyme. Um, top of 928, know that one, consonants. Okay. And then we have a poem on 929 I want us to look at. This is actually in the syllabus for later. We'll just go ahead and do it now. And uh, because it's you know got different kinds of rhyme and such. So God's grandeur, Gerard Manley Hopkins. My, uh, Hopkins was a Jesuit priest. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel, being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And through the last light, excuse me, and though the last lights off the black west went, O morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. So you've got a lot of different kinds of the rhyme that are mentioned on 927 in there. You've got internal rhyme. You've got um, terms that we talked about previously. Alliteration and um, assonance. So grandeur, God, gathers, greatness. Wreck, rod, all examples of alliteration. But what's the poem getting at? You, the poem's divided, notice, into two stanzas. The first stanza is eight lines. The second stanza is six lines. And he says, declaratively, in that first sentence, or first line, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Grandeur. It's like glory. Presence, if you want. It, the world, or is it the grandeur of God, will flame out like shining from shook foil. It's the grandeur of God. It's the glory of God. It will show, in other words. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crush. And your gloss tells you, you know, it's like olive, oils, uh, olive oil. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Now not wreck his rod. Why do men then now not obey God. Okay. Now, he's writing this in 1877. He's saying, why do, we, why do we ignore him? Why do we not pay any attention? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Why repeat, have trod? What's the implication? Well, what's the first word in that line? Generations. It's more than one. Gener a generation has trod, another generation has trod, another generation has trod. He's saying humanity has done what? They've walked all over the earth. And all is seared with trade. What's the all? Everything we do. What does it mean to sear something? John Kerry once famously said, that his memories of Vietnam, I think of actually going into Cambodia, were seared in his memory. Okay? So what do you do when you sear something? You burn it in. It's like a branding iron. Okay? So all is seared with trade. 
that is like branded with. Everything we do involves money in somehow. Bleared, smeared with toil. That is, with work. We're either working to do what? To get something or to make something. And where's man's smudge and shares man's smell? Again, what is doing the wearing, the sharing, the blearing? The world. He's saying the world is totally marked by humanity. This is 1877. Imagine him writing today how much more he would say. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Why is the soil bare? What happens if you don't let a patch of ground lie fallow for a while? Fallow means just letting it do what it does on its own naturally. What happens if you plant a field again and again and again and again and again and you plant specifically the same crop year in, year out? The soil will go bad. It kills the soil. Nothing will grow after a while. He's saying that's what we've done <coughs> to the world. The soil is bare now. It doesn't produce. And, he says, nor can foot feel it. Why? Because we are shod. That is, we wear shoes. So, part of his point is humanity has done what with nature? Or to nature? Removed ourselves. Separated from nature. After all, you know, look at where we are right now. We're in a classroom, okay? And everything in this classroom mediates us from out there. The air is regulated. The light is regulated. The heat, if the heat is on, is regulated. If it's summertime, it's cool. And then you go out here, you go out there, and what happens? You hit with the blast of hot summer humid air. But we don't have that in here. Okay? He's saying we've divorced ourselves from the real world. And for all this, that is, in spite of all this, nature is never spent. See, he would not hold with the environmentalists who say, oh, we're going to destroy the world. He'd say, no, no, we never can. Why? Because there lives the dearest freshness deep down thing. That is, deep down, there are things still alive. Deep down, there is a freshness. It's going to be told to us why that is in the last couple of lines. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. What's the, the purpose for the juxtaposition of the light off the west in morning in the east? Because the, the night, the light going off in the west, the implication of coming darkness... Depending upon your political persuasion, you know, tomorrow could be what? Tomorrow could be utter disaster. Okay? It will be utter disaster, you know, seemingly, for one political party. Or maybe 2020 would be the better example. Okay? He's saying all looks dark. But as soon as that last blackness shut up. Ever since Steve Jobs died, Apple has just gone down. <laughs> Tim Cook ought to be hung. So, you get this darkness, but what happens when that darkest gets... What does little orphan Annie sing? Horribly. hate that place. The sun will what? Will always come up tomorrow. That's what he means. Morning at the Brown Brink, Eastward Springs. Why? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods. And that's an echo back of Genesis. The Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep and such. Right. So you've got a little, you know, explanation of what the poem means there. 
turn to 931. And on 930, you got a, a you know quite a bit about um, alliteration and the sounds of the poem, the rhyme and such. 931. Lewis Carroll, Charles Lutwidge Dodson. What else did Carroll write other than this little poem? What famous two, I don't know if you'd really call them novels. Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass about Alice going into Wonderland, okay? He was a mathematician, taught geometry in Oxford, photographer. Jabberwocky, written in 1871, is a nonsense poem. Why? Because it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's literal nonsense. You can't read it and then go, oh, I get what he's saying. Because all you can say that he's saying is somebody took a vorpal blade and went snickersnack and cut off the head of a jabberwock. You don't know what a jabberwock is. You don't know what a vorpal blade looks like. But snickersnack has a sound quality to it. So, twas brilliant in, this, in one other thing. He uses here or creates what are called portmanteau words. That is, where you take part of one word, part of another word, jam them together. I often do this accidentally by, when I'm teaching. My brain goes faster than my mouth. And I put two things together, right? So, twas brillig in the slithy toes. Brillig. Brit, bright? And then what's the lig? I don't know. And the slidey toe, so I, we were trying to do slide with this. Does it come from slide? Slithy, slither with an E on the end? Slippery with slither kind of put in there, so it's slithy? Twas brillig in the slithy toes, the gyre and jimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the moan revs outgrave. Now, notice, it's all nonsense, but... In that nonsense, you've got nouns, you've got verbs, and it's clear what are verbs. It's clear what are nouns, because they behave like those parts of speech should. Beware the jabberwock, my son. No, that makes sense, other than not knowing what a jabberwock is. That might just mean, you know, you've got a poor knowledge of uh, biology or botany or something. Herbology. <laughs> the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand long time to make some foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree and stood a while in thought. Notice, not every line is total nonsense. Some of the lines are perfectly good English and make total sense. He stood a while in thought. You get an image of somebody standing there. But he's doing it by a tum-tum tree. And as an oofish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. What does something do if it burbles? It's a verb. So what's it doing? What's it sound like? Bubble? Gargle? So, verbal. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snickersnack. He left it dead, and with its head, he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, friend, just a kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig in the slidey toes, the jar and jimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoes and the moan raths out grave. Okay? So it's a nonsense poem, so it doesn't mean anything. So why did he write it? Nobody spends at least 28 minutes, because it's 28 lines long. I, you know, I'll be real conservative and say it only took him a minute for each line. Nobody spends 28 minutes to write something like this without a reason. So what's the reason? Reason doesn't have to be an idea. 
Remember, so much depends on a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. That's just about an image. This is about what? Sound. You know who loves this poem? Just go crazy for it. Little kids. Why? One, they've got great imaginations. And their imaginations fill in the words with things that none of us are aware of. So they understand the frumious bandersnatch. Why? They make something up up here. Okay? And they love the sounds of it. It's all it's there for. Okay, go from there to... I think we skipped to rhythm. Yeah, chapter 29, Patterns of Rhythm, 946 and 947. So, know the terms on 946 and 47. On 948, yeah, I know all those. Uh, 949, just the ones at the bottom. Line, and then iambic pentameter, blank verse, but not sponde. So, a 949, line, iambic pentameter, and blank verse. A 950, all of those but Pyrrhic. So masculine ending, feminine ending, Seshura, in stopped line, run on line, and in All right? So this is a section on rhythm. Listen to the rhythm of the next poem. Because you can read this next poem very slowly and not let the rhythm work. You can read it this way. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Now, a couple of things. I'm going to read it again in a moment. Notice the first line. No mark of punctuation at the end. Why? It runs on to the next line. That's an example of a run-on line or an enjammed line. So you don't pause at the end. You just read right on. This is what it should be like. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now, I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. Notice the difference between the rhythm in the first four lines and the rhythm in lines five and six. Okay? He just changes it quite a bit. The child is father of the man. And I could wish my days to be about each to each by natural piety. Okay? Question, what's this poem about? My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Why? What does he mean his heart leaps up? Does his heart literally go? No. Louder. He's excited. Probably not. How so? How many of you were around, was it this year or was it last year? For the um, total solar eclipse, how many of you took the time to go outside and watch it? Okay, why? How many of you thought, damn, that's cool? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool to see something like that. That's, that is a thing for which the, the adjective awesome is created. Okay, It is something that instills awe. When you see middle of the day and it goes dark, okay? That's what he means. It's like looking out, you know, um, looking out at a sunset when the sky is full of dust and stuff. And it's just flaming red, okay? Or being around, you know, when a volcano goes off and seeing that. One time when I was um, in college... Uh, two years of my college were in Oregon, just south of Portland, 
And one of the mornings I was on the soccer team, one of the mornings we got up to, had a game that day, and Mount St. Helens had erupted. Not the big eruption, this is what, the little one. And there's about, I don't know, half inch of ash covering everything, right? It's pretty cool. So, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, that is, and it did when I was little. So is it now I am a man? Well, what's the difference between a five-year-old and, let's say, a 56-year-old? What does a 56-year-old understand about what makes a rainbow to a five-year-old's understanding? Does a five-year-old understand about refraction of light, how water droplets in the air are bending the white light into its constituent colors? Nope. They just think, cool. Okay? Imagination, sense of wonder. So, so is it now I am a man. The speaker is telling us, I still look at the natural world through the eyes of a child. I look at it through the eyes of wonder. So be it when I shall grow old. Okay? Notice, 1770, he dies in 1850. He's 37 when he writes this. He doesn't consider himself old. But when I shall grow old, I will see the rainbow this way, or let me die. The or let me die means now. Let me die before I get so jaded that I can't look out this window and see this tree with these beautiful leaves and go, wow, it's beautiful. Rather than just, it's a tree and it's in the way. Let's you know, get rid of it. The child is father of the man. That's an example of what that was on the quiz. I think it was on the quiz. It's an oxymoron. How so? An oxymoron appears to be a contradictory statement. And yet, looked at more closely, it's not. So how is a child father of the man? Where does the man come from? We tend to think, ah, only men beget children, you know, with women. And I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Natural piety. Piety, kind of this taking me outside myself, seeing myself part of a bigger picture, but natural. See, Wordsworth was a romantic. Romantic was a literary movement, late 19th century, early um, late 18th century, early 19th century, that emphasized a return to the natural world, that emphasized seeing beauty in the everyday common things that one sees around oneself. Rocks, trees, animals, people. Rather than all this, all this artificial stuff like architecture and buildings and big long epic poems and such, right? Go from there to see how we're on the poetic forms. Yeah, I think so. To poetic forms. And know the terms on this is uh, chapter 30, pages 9, 70, 71. Know the terms on 70 and 71. Let's see. And 72. On 973, um, no quatrain in the different sonnets at the bottom of the page. So, bottom of page 973, the Italian sonnet. Sonnets were first created by Franciscus, I think it's Franciscus, by Francis Petrarch, Italian poet writing in the 14th century. And he wrote a series of poems to a woman named Laura that he fell in love with. And they're called sonnets, which just meant, um, from Sonetto, which meant kind of little love song. Okay? All sonnets have 14 lines. The structure of the sonnet, however, can vary. Okay? 
So all sonnets had 14 lines. The Italian sonnets are divided into two parts, an octave, the first eight lines, and the sestet, final six lines. Okay? And they tend to have a particular rhyme scheme. You've got the rhyme scheme at the bottom of page 973, though there are some variations. Um, and then on 974 and 75, you have two forms of the Italian sonnet. These are written by Englishmen. Because the Italian sonnet is going to differ from the English sonnet that we'll talk about in just a moment. So Wordsworth's, same guy who wrote My Heart Leaps Up. The world is too much with us. The world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Pause there. Okay? I forgot to mention. In an Italian sonnet, you usually have a what's called a volta. Here. Which is a turn. At the end of line 8, beginning of line 9. And the turn is you have a change of emphasis, you have a change of tone. Okay? So, it moves us not. Period, hyphen. There's a big pause there. That's the turn. Great God. I'd rather be a pagan suckle than a creed outworn. So might I, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sighed of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. So let's look at the, first, at the octave, the first eight lines. Very similar to some of the ideas in God's grandeur, which is written many years later, 70 years after this one. Okay? but also has some of the same ideas and images that are in My Heart Leaps Up. The world is too much with us. What do you mean by the world? He doesn't mean the natural world. He means civilized society. Being in the cities. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our power. Late and soon, it kind of means all the time. We do what? We spend our lives for two things. Getting and spending. Taking, giving. Not giving as in giving gifts, but taking money and giving something in exchange for that. Or giving something and receiving something in exchange. Little we see in nature that is ours. That is, we don't see anything in nature that is what? Worth anything. We don't see anything in nature that bears on me or impacts me. No, we have given our hearts away a sordid boon. Sordid, dirty, worthless almost. Boon? Boon means reward. So, not a gift well received or well given. And so he moves from there to the sea. The sea that bears a bosom to the moon. Notice, the sea is totally open to the moon. Okay? Or the wind that will be howling at all hours, like what we're expecting tonight. And are up gathered now like sleeping flowers. The winds are what? The winds aren't blowing now, it's still. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. What's the it? The sea, the moon, the winds, the flowers, the world out there, the natural world. It what? It moves us not. We are out of tune. We are like 
an Aeolian harp or lyre, right? That made music by the wind blowing through it. He's saying, we, we're supposed to be the harp. What's the wind? The natural world. That should be blowing through us, moving us. But we are what? We are out of tune. We don't work. So, great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled than a creed out worn. Now, I said, you know, that the romantics emphasize the natural world as opposed to kind of civilized society. Well, what's part of civilized society? Civilized, organized religion. He says, I'd rather hold to an outworn, unbelieved, outdated, proven false belief system, such as, so might I, standing on this pleasantly, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Glimpses of what? Proteus rising from the sea, or here old Triton. Poseidon coming out of the ocean. I would rather hold, he says, to an old belief system that allowed me what? To see something in nature, rather than to say, oh, the reason leaves are so beautiful is because of fall and photosynthesis in the trees is stopping because they are getting ready to hibernate and go dormant for the winter, blah, 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 and give the scientific definition. Now, bottom of that page, English side or Shakespearean side. Why? Because this is the form Shakespeare used. Doesn't have a quatrain and sestet. It has three, excuse me, doesn't have an octave and sestet. It has three quatrains and a final couplet. And you get the rhyme scheme um, there. The final couplet usually, yeah, usually serves um, as a conclusion, a summation of the ideas that are presented in the first part. Okay? So, on 976, you've got two sonnets by Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, and my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun? Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets. Of those, Um, 1 through 126 are two what's called the golden-haired two or about the golden-haired youth 127 and 152 are two or about the dark lady okay golden-haired youth we don't know who this person is if you can figure it out, if you can nail who the golden-haired youth is described in the sonnets, you could name pretty much your chair of English at any university in the world, like Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, etc. Because people have been wondering for 400 years, who is this person that is being described? Similarly with the Dark Lady. Okay? And I should say, the Dark Lady is implied dark because she's dark-skinned. Dark Lady is implied in some of these because it's pretty clear from a few of them. Whoever this golden-haired youth is, he and the Dark Lady become friends and hook up, literally. I mean, they have sex, okay? The Dark Lady is the speaker of the poems, mistress. The golden-haired youth is his close friend, okay? And so he writes some about these two getting together and how he loses both his best friend and what the hell is going on out there and um, his mistress and his best friend right and then the, the golden haired youth is referred to some in these okay all that being said this first one shall I compare thee to a summer's day this is sonnet 18 right 
this is about the golden-haired youth. This poem is usually included in the little anthologies, you know, the 100 best love poems. It's not a love poem. In the, in the opening of the sonnets, the first 20 or so, what Shakespeare is doing is he has the persona of the sonnets, the speaker of the sonnets, tell this guy, go have children. Not go get married. Go have children. Go, you know, spread your seed. Why? Because you are so gorgeous. You are so handsome. It would be a shame for you to die and for the world not to have copies of you. Okay? So, ladies, pick your man for who, you know, should not die without having children. I usually hear, you know, Brad Pitt, uh, Chris Pine, Chris Evans, Chris Pratt, where's the fourth one? Chris Hemsworth, all those guys. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a debt. Shakespeare's day, those two words rhyme. Temperate and date rhyme. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. By chance or nature's unchanging course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag when thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So let's stop there. First stanza. Shall I compare you to a summer's day? It's almost like the person in the sitting room and is thinking, Lisa, what can I compare you to? Summer's day? Okay, well, let's think about that. What is summer like? Well, you're more lovely and more temperate than summer. How so? So the speaker tells us, early summer, May, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Storms come. What happens to those darling buds? They get blasted. They get killed. And what else? Summer's lease hath all too short a date. That is, and summer ends early sometimes. No, you are, go back to the second line, you are more temperate than that. Temperate means what? Moderate, even. So summer can be really cold and stormy and windy, and summer can be, can end very quickly. What else? Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. I mean, if you've ever been in Murfreesboro in the middle of August, when we're in a triple-digit heat wave, you know it's horrible. Because I'm stupid, I decided to build a deck several years ago, and it happened to be just as we went into a two-week-long triple-digit heat wave. Did not get, during the days, it was over 100 degrees every day. 900-square-foot deck, about the size of this room. Stupid. So... Sometimes the hot eye of heaven shines too hot, and often is his gold complexion dim. That is, it's cloudy. The Brits hate when July goes by and they haven't had any 80-degree days. I, when I teach in London, I love going to London, and it's 65 every day. Just absolutely go crazy. They hate that. Why? Because they want to get their flabby white bodies out in the sun, and I mean, it's not a pretty sight, usually. So, often is gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines. Fair from fair means beauty from beauty declines, right? What, would, what did we see in the two Carpe Diem poems? Use your beauty now, why? Or, or good looks. Yeah, because you're not going to be beautiful 50, 60 years from now. Why does it decline? By chance, accidents happen, or nature's changing course. What does nature's changing course do? It untrims you. What does it mean, untrims you? You trim yourself every morning to get ready for... School and such? Yeah, some of us do. Some of you do. 
We're getting ready for two holidays coming up. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving dinner with all the trimmings. What are the trimmings? All the side dishes. Well, what does that mean, the trimmings? Those are adornments. Because what's, what's, you know, center stage Thanksgiving? The turkey. So the mashed potatoes, the beef, all that other stuff, that's secondary. Okay? Christmas tree, you trim the tree. What does that mean? You're not shaping it with pruning shears. You're decorating it. So nature, nature's changing course, untrimmed. All the adornments are taken away. Your hair falls out. Your nice, you know, top body gets all saggy, etc. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. And we'll stop there since we're running out. So we'll pick up with that poem. Like I said, there won't be a quiz on Wednesday, but there might on uh, Friday.